Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Equityverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about the volatility index, or the VIX, and how it can be used to navigate equity markets. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and check out the Telegram channel, which we have a link to in the description below. If you wanna talk about these markets, of course, you can join that Telegram channel and talk with 40,000 of your closest friends. Let's go ahead and jump in. Now, the volatility index, or the VIX, is something we, we talk about somewhat infrequently on the channel, but the reason why I'm bringing it up today is because it's coming down to a, a, a fairly historic level of support during this inflationary bear market, okay? So if you were to take sort of a line in the sand here, and, and maybe we should draw a rectangle just to sort of show you the range at which the VIX has previously bottomed, you, you can see, you know, we had a bottom here in August and in December of 2022, and now we're coming into that same range in January of 2023. Now, you might be wondering, what is the usefulness of the VIX? What would the VIX bottoming even mean? Well, what's interesting is we also know that the S&P has been essentially putting in lower highs for a quite a long period of time, right? I mean, you know, ever since January of 2022, we know the, the, the S&P 500, it continues to put in lower highs. And it's also been putting in lower lows, although arguably recently, some people are, are, are speculating whether this is, is sort of a turning point. And actually in my last video on the S&P 500, where we talked about this bear market, I mentioned that these wicks were telling us that the bulls were, were potentially prepared to launch sort of a counterattack here in the short term, okay? Now, what does the VIX tell us when we overlay it with the S&P 500? Well, first of all, remember, this the, the VIX bottomed, so we've had several different bottoms on the VIX, so this is the one from August of 2022, this is the one from December, okay? They both bottomed at around that 18 to 19 level. If you go take a look at the S&P 500, August corresponded to this top on the S&P, and then this was the December top, right? So again, if you go back and look at the VIX and we continue to take this all the way across, right, you'll see another time where it came down into this 18 to 19 level. And this one was back at the end of March and early April. And you'll know that that corresponded to that top. So perhaps what I'll do is I will now overlay the S&P 500 on this chart so that we can better show the comparison between the VIX and the S&P 500. What you may notice, and we'll just simply draw a few rectangles here uh, to show you sort of that range, what you'll notice is that when the VIX historically, at least during this inflationary bear market, it's not always like this, of course, but during this inflationary bear market, any time that the VIX has come down to this level, it actually has marked a, a short-term top in the S&P 500, right? So if we were to just sort of take a, a very brief look at, at every single time this has happened, you can see that you know the VIX hit seven, you know that 18 to 19 level here and it corresponded to that top. And then when it hit the, the 18 to 19 level over here, it corresponded to the top back in March. And then furthermore, um, if, you, if you look at it in December, right, when the VIX went down again to that 18 to 19 level, it also corresponded to this top in the S&P 500, right? So, uh, so March, August, and December. Again, you can see it very clearly over here, right? March, August, and December. And each of those three times, we found the VIX bottoming at around that 18 to 19 level, okay? So uh, for reference, the lowest it went back in April was around 18.45. Uh, the lowest it went over here in August was around 19.12. We're actually below that right now. And then the lowest that it went in December was 18.95. So it's not that dissimilar from where the, you know, from where the, from where the VIX sits today. And we're also coming back up on that 4,000 level for the S&P 500. Now, the one point where it would diverge a little bit is if you actually go to the very beginning of this, uh, of the inflationary bear market, right? So the very first one, uh, the, the very first top on the S&P 500, as we know, occurred all the way back here 
in, in January, right? So it occurred in January, but back then the VIX bottomed all the way at around that 16 to 17 level. So it actually went just a bit lower. So the point I'm trying to make at least is that the VIX is, it, it can be a useful tool in navigating the equity markets. It's not necessarily going to tell you, uh, you know, every, every little thing that happens, but you can see that the VIX, at least since the inflationary bear market got underway, the VIX had been bottoming around that, that 18 to 19 level with the exception of the very beginning phase of the bear market where it, it bottomed right around that 16 to 17 level. So again, right now the VIX is sitting just over 19. And, and if you're not following the VIX, I would, I would at least encourage you to add it to your watch list so that as you see the further it goes down, the more likely you're gonna see this bounce back up to the, up to the upside. The other way we can look at this is to look at the, the short-term tops on the VIX. So in the same way that there's been bottoms on the VIX around that 18 to 19 level, we can also note that during this inflationary bear market, there's also been very similar tops on the VIX as well. And what you may notice is that the last, the, the last top here, so we had a top on the VIX, at around um, you know, September 28th, at around that 34 to 35, and then again in October, and that corresponded to this double bottom, right? So it tops at around 34 to 35 during this inflationary bear market, which also corresponded to the bottom on the S&P 500, right? And if you go back to June, uh, you can see that it also topped at around that 34 to 35 level, which also corresponded to the S&P finding a bottom. And then again, over here, um, the, the, the VIX tops at around, again, that same like 34 to 35 level, maybe with a spike up to, up to around 36.64, which sort of also corresponded to at least this local low on the, on the S&P 500. And you can continue to sort of go on, right? It seems like a lot of times when the VIX is topping at around that 34 to 35 or maybe even 36 level, it's also corresponding to at least a, a local low on the S&P 500, right? You know, essentially time and time again, the VIX is up here, the S&P is, is, is hitting some type of a bottom. And again, even over here before the bear market started back in December of 2021, you'll notice that the S&P hit some type of a local bottom at, a, at the, when the VIX was around that 34 to 35 level, and then it, it went higher. And it was when it went higher, right, over here, so we know that the VIX um, uh, went higher, or sorry, the S&P 500 went higher, and that was when the, the, the VIX was, was going uh, just a bit lower. And so I, I think one way to potentially look at this, and I, I'm just gonna clean this up a little bit, so I just wanna remove everything uh, very briefly, right? And, and just look at it like this with just two rectangles on here so we can really isolate you know the, the VIX and, and what it has where the range really has been for the most part for the entirety of 2022 and now early 2023 and you'll notice that you know with the exception of, of really early on so with the exception of say like January um, when when the VIX went all the way down to that 16 to 17 level, we've basically been in this window where the VIX goes all the way up to 30, the 34 to 36 range or so, and that tends to represent tops on the S&P 500, whereas when it comes down to the 18 to 19 level, it is represented bottoms on the S&P 500. So it's just been sort of like, you know, ping, uh, like, like ping ponging um, throughout here, and, and the tops on the VIX have been fairly accurate at calling bottoms, and, and the bottoms here on the VIX at around 18 and 19 have actually been fairly good at, at calling tops, okay? So, you know, to sort of bring this home, I'd like to spend a little bit of time just talking about the S&P 500. I understand a lot of people are probably ho hoping I would talk about uh, Bitcoin in this video, but I did just put out a video on it yesterday. And I know that Bitcoin has rallied up today, um, uh, you know, basically to almost $19,000. But in the, in the video we did yesterday, we talked about, right, this likely outcome. I mean, Bitcoin seemed to have some momentum. And we talked about, you know, where it could potentially go. So it is coming up on, on some of those levels we talked about. So I'd encourage you to just go watch that video. If you want to hear me talk about Bitcoin, I'll probably talk more about it tomorrow. 
or maybe even later today. But I did want to at least briefly talk about this because the S&P 500 is coming up here on a pretty important resistance level, right? So, you know, we know that the VIX has been instrumental in calling tops and bottoms, right? Bottoms have been around that 18 to 19 level, except for January when it went down to the 16 to 17 level. And then tops have been around that 34 to 35 level with maybe one, one or two exceptions at 36. It's important because the S&P for the fifth time is coming up on the downtrend line, right? So you'll notice that we've held resistance at the downtrend line, not once, not twice, not three times, not four times. You could even argue this was sort of four and five because we had a double top, but let's just call it, you know, just one, right? So four times rejected by the downtrend line. And now we are testing it once again. Now, this might automatically lead you to believe that we will break through. And I would argue there is a chance that it could happen, right? I'm not, you know, it is dangerous to, to, to sit and, and, and proclaim that anything has to happen, right? If, if, if this inflationary bear market has taught us anything, it's that it makes a fool of both the bulls and the bears, right? The bulls will go a while thinking they're right, and then the bears will go a while thinking that they're right. And actually, it, it almost feels like the bulls have probably felt like they're right more often than the bears just because a lot of times we'll trend up for so long and then the new downtrend can happen very, very quickly and, and take us to new lows. And then and then you start the, the uptrend again, right? And we just sort of rinse and repeat this same brutal cycle over and over. But there were some times where we sort of tested the bottom and then we then double tested it, right? Here we can close and then we bounce and then we sort of double tested it again. So you could argue that there's you know sort of a similar scenario going on up here where we tested the top and then we came back down here and everyone thought it was gonna come back down here and it didn't, right? It, it actually showed support here um, on these wicks. We, we actually talked about that in the last video on the S&P and, and, it, and it moved back up, right? And now we're, we're testing it again. Now, here's the tricky part, okay? Now, my base case for the S&P 500, again, has just been lower highs, right? This has been my base case for quite a long period of time, and, and namely because we know that the Fed's raising interest rates, and this is causing a liquidity crisis, okay? We've talked about this. It's like when, you, when you're standing around a pool, and I've given this, this, this sort of, um, you know, this analogy before, if, if we're all standing around a pool, and, and the Fed is draining liquidity from the system, so they've pulled the plug at the bottom, liquidity is leaving the pool, right? So liquidity in the pool is going down. It doesn't mean that if enough investors are standing around the pool with a cup of water, if we all throw it in at the same time, then the levels in the pool can temporarily go up, right? They can go up in the, in the short term, but it doesn't change the fact that if you wait long enough, the, the, the level of the pool will still go down. And the reason is because, again, the Fed is draining liquidity from the system. And this is kind of a way that you can better think about these bear market rallies, right? So you get all these bear market rallies, but they haven't actually led to new highs, right? Now, I do want to talk about one scenario, okay? So my, again, my base case um, has, has, even over here in, in December, if you followed me then or in August, my base case has just simply been that we'll just get rejected by the downtrend line, right? That's the base case. It just seems like the most likely outcome. Every time we get close to the trend line, everyone says we're going to break through it. And then so far it hasn't happened, right? It will eventually happen, okay? It will eventually happen. But as we've discussed before, whenever it does happen, right? Whenever it does, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's over. Okay, this is the, 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 the bear market from the dot-com crash. And we actually had a very similar downtrend line that we tested multiple times. And when we finally broke through it, it probably would have made people think that the bear market was over, when in reality, it was just one step away from the sort of the final capitulation, right? And what's interesting is about this, if you actually zoom in on this, on this, um, um, you know, on this time frame over here, what you'll notice is that we actually had a very similar thing occur, right? So we had sort of like a top that was just below the trend line and then a double top, right? And then it came back down. I imagine a lot of people would have assumed it was going to go put on a new low and we had those wicks again, right? Those wicks. And it was like, all right, well, the bulls are going to give it another go. And the bulls gave it enough juice to actually get us beyond the downtrend line, but it ended up just simply being a triple top, right? And then we came back down to finalize the bear market. 
note that this triple top occurred in Q1 of that year, right? Now, this bear market by that time had already been going on a lot longer because it had started in September of 2000. So arguably, if you want to compare in terms of a time-based perspective where we could be, if it had to last the same amount of time, which it probably will last a very different amount of time than prior bear markets, um, then you would actually have to go to say like, you know, September of 2001, which would actually put us somewhere over here, right? So that doesn't really, it, it, there's not a perfect correspondence here between this bear market and the last one, okay? They, they do sort of follow their their um, their own course. They, they don't, they, they certainly don't operate at the at the same rate and every uh, we know that every single bear market is in fact different the one thing i will say is that in terms of an average length of a bear market the s p 500 in 2022 experienced what would be an average bear market okay so this is an average bear market it lasts about like eight or nine months um and a, and a fairly a fairly average drawdown okay fairly average drawdown that lasts about eight or nine months about 27 27% to the downside. And so then the question is 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 this bear market average or is it not? And that's where you have to decide whether you think a recession is coming because while bear markets that do not include recessions might only last 8 or 9 months on average, bear markets that do include recessions typically last, you know, where somewhere between 1 to 2 years. And if we are getting a recession, then that is a risk that you have to consider. Again, I will say again, we are simply not saying that anything has to happen. By saying anything has to happen, you're sort of locking yourself into one scenario or one outcome. And when that happens, if it doesn't go your way, then you know, you're, you're not hedged, right? And it's important to be hedged um, in, in, in various ways. So we're not saying that anything has to happen, but I have shown the risks as to why a recession could occur. And if a recession does occur, then it means the bear market is not over. And if the bear market is not over, then even if we do break the downtrend line, it doesn't mean we're actually going to, to sustain it, okay? Um, you could even imagine uh, you know, if you, you know, even a scenario where it could rally all the way up to 4,100, 4,200, maybe even 4,300, but it doesn't necessarily change the recession risk, right? It, it doesn't change that there's still that risk that exists. And again, you know, I mean, I, I know there are some, some very optimistic people who say that a recession does not have to occur, and they're essentially betting on the labor market remaining relatively tight. So you're, you know, if you, if you think a recession is not going to occur, I, I would imagine that you're thinking that the, the labor market will remain tight despite the tightening by the Federal Reserve. And if that's the camp that you sit in and you think that a recession will not happen, then I imagine that you would think that this would be the bottom of, of, the, of the bear market. Okay, so hopefully this perspective is at least somewhat useful in, in navigating um, this market. I do, as I've said before, I, I think that you know, throughout 2022, I, I said many, many times that, that cash was king. I still think there are still elements of it being king in 2023. It doesn't mean you're not going to find deals throughout this year. I do think 2023 is going to be full of, of a lot of good opportunities on, on risk assets in general. But hopefully, hopefully understanding the VIX and how it has operated over the last year um, provides you with some insight that you maybe previously did not have. Again, right now it's sitting at 19.11. The lowest it has gone today is 19.07. And actually back in December, it bottomed at 18.95. So if the S&P were to rally to the top of this trend line right here, it would take it to around that 40,040. So 4040, all right? If the S&P goes to 4040, then you're likely looking at a VIX below 19. And if it goes below 19, that's essentially where the VIX has previously bottomed for this entire bear market, except for with the exception of January. Do note that the 200-day SMA is also currently being tested. I, I think we're slightly above it. Um, we are. So if you take a if you take a very brief look here at the um, a 200 day, you can see that it has provided a, a significant level of resistance during this bear market so far, and that every single time we've gotten above it, so we've gotten above it a few times, 
um, since the bear market began, but they were all relatively short lived. And so we find ourselves above it once again. The, the 200 day SMA is at 39.84. We're currently sitting at 39.91. So again, we find ourselves above it. Um, but again, the question is, is, is will it be sustained or will it just simply be another lower high or even a, a triple top? Okay, so that is what I, I think it's important to look at. And if you're wondering, you know, what would be some type of invalidation for, you know, for all of this, I, I would have to imagine that if you if you break the trend line and, and then you come back down and then, you know, you're you hold at a, at a higher low, um, that could be somewhat optimistic. But you'd also have to keep a close eye, I think, on on the you know what the Federal Reserve is doing. OK, because the Federal Reserve holds the key to understanding, in my opinion, whether we go into a recession. They're responsible for a lot of the recessions of the past by tightening policy. Okay, it's the over tightening of policy by the Federal Reserve that kicks us into a recession. That's one of the reasons why inflationary periods like the 70s are ripe with several recessions, whereas periods like the last 10 years are not. It's just because we haven't had high inflation in a long time. When we have high inflation, it changes the reaction by the Federal Reserve. And when the Federal Reserve changes into a more hawkish stance, which is what they've done, it runs a higher risk of a recession than it otherwise would have. So in addition to having to see a higher low and then um, you know, continuously higher lows and no longer lower highs, I think you'd also have to see, you know, is the Federal Reserve going to meet their 2% objective on inflation without causing a sharp rise in the unemployment rate? And right now, the Federal Reserve, of course, they've been talking about raising interest rates. I mean, I, you know, the market right now is saying the highest probability is another 25 basis point rate hike in February, and then I think another 25 basis point rate hike in March. This will get the Fed funds rate up to around that 5% level uh, by the first quarter. And so then the question is, is what happens after that, right? What happens after March? Do they continue raising at all? Do they sit and hold? And if they do just sit and hold, does it, does it mean that inflation keeps going down or does inflation stay somewhat sticky? Because if inflation goes back up with the reopening of China or something, then the, the Fed might have to, to continue to raise interest rates. You know, in the past, I've said before that I think the, the terminal rate is, is probably somewhere between four to 5%. That was what I said for the first half of 2022. And then in the second half, I revised that to say somewhere between five to five and a half percent. I still think they are going to at least make it to five percent unless they break something between now and then. But as of right now, um, it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like that's happening. So I do think that they will likely make it to five percent. And then after making it to five percent, I, I think they're going to have to keep a close eye on on CPI and see, is it actually coming down in a material way? And it's a tough balance because you have to, you know, they want to raise interest rates enough and for long enough to bring inflation back down, but they also run the risk of tightening too much and sending the U.S. economy into, into a recession. And again, the reason why that's important is because risk assets like the S&P 500, they tend to bottom during the recession, okay? So again, I understand you know, long term, we, we we might not see a recession. I understand there's a, a chance of that happening, but I would be remiss if we didn't at least talk about it and plan for it, because if it does happen, all the warning signs would have been there. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and again, check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at IntoTheCryptoverse.com. We do have several different tiers, including a free one. You can find a link to that down in the description below. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Bye.